welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Here we are with the Monitor Steve setup once again. It's been a little while since we've brought this thing out, but we have something interesting today to talk about, and that is Intel's TDP related stuff, B560 related stuff, and that is all because of your video, Steve. So why don't you just run us through yeah. a little bit about yeah, what we want to talk about today? Well, for those of you who missed the video, it probably makes sense to go watch that video first, but I suppose a summary is I was doing some B560 VRM temperature testing because that's been highly requested, started on Z590, but with B560 making more sense because now it supports memory overclocking. And then I'd say the CPUs that make the most sense are the locked parts or the yep. lower end parts, like you know your 11400 type series, 11700, they're really good value now because you know, very little overclocking headroom, all the things you guys are probably aware of. So I start, set out to do the B560 VRM temperature testing and found that it wasn't as straightforward as I thought it might have been. I started on the higher end boards, they operated as expected. So with something like a Core i7-11700, we're looking at a 4.4 gigahertz all-core frequency. But some of the other boards, 3.2, 3, 2.9. Uh, so it was a bit all over the place out of the box. And then some of them, you could remove the power limits and get the 4.4 gigahertz. Uh, some of them did 4.4 gigahertz with extremely high temperatures. That content still yet to come. Uh, and then others weren't able to achieve 4.4 and achieve stuff like 4.2, which is fairly close, but it, it's still not there. So it was quite important which board you bought. And then at least the whole mess where some boards you would expect, like even mid-range boards, like around the $150 US mark, which you know used to be a lot of money to spend on a motherboard, they would run with the, the power limits enforced. So it was a disaster really for those using the, the more desirable 65 watt processors, because as we found in that video, the performance uplift can be as great as 50% between boards. So that's quite incredible, really. So we made the video yeah. covering that. Uh, and I would say the feedback was largely positive, around 99% <laughs> positive feedback on that one. So that's great. Uh, and the reason we're making this video isn't because to directly address any negative feedback, though a lot of these questions will be um, brought up more because of either confusion or, or the negative type stuff. But just because there's a lot of misconceptions around this uh, and we'd like to address them. And a lot of it is reasonable enough for the users to be confused about it because it is quite confusing and Intel has, I'd say deliberately made it confusing and that's what we're gonna work through. So I think one of the first things we can start on is I think the Intel spec, that's probably what comes up the most. And I think with most of the people that were a bit confused about our video and who was to blame or what was going on, didn't really understand what the Intel spec is. And again, you can be excused for that because <laughs> Intel does not make it clear what their, their broad, or as I said in the video, their loosely defined specification is. So most people think of the Intel spec, the spec as the TDP spec, which you, know, you have PL1, PL2, uh, PL2 enforced uh, using a, a turbo timer. And that's the specification that Intel defines, that's their, what would you say, uh, Gamers Nexus refers to it as the guideline or their, their guidance. Yeah, so essentially and when Intel is, you know, producing, they produce a document that they send to OEMs mm -hmm. who make motherboards, who make desktops, who make even laptops for laptop processors, and it has a list of their sort of default values, which as you say, Gamers mm -hmm. Nexus sort of refers to as guidelines or something along there, and you'll have in that table um, maybe I'll be able to find it and put it up on the screen, but it will have a PL1 and it will usually state that as the TDP of the processor. So that will mm -hmm. be 65 watts for a locked part. Then there'll be a PL2, which will be the turbo boost period. And then there'll be a TAU, which is the turbo boost duration. So the combination of all these things tells you how high the power can go when we're boosting in the boost state, how long that boost state can be, and then what power level do we drop down to once we're beyond the boost period. And Intel provides some default values for that. But that's not the end of the story, is it? No, so there's been a lot of videos over the years that explain all the stuff that Tim just talked about. And regular users, they kind of glaze over and go, I've, I've heard all these things and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It's quite complicated. And it kind of is. And it, it, as Tim said, it's not the only specification. So these processes, which we used to talk about more, have a clock multiplier table. It was much more simple when they had like four <laughs> cores. So there was only, there was four different states. So I've got 
some notes here. I've got the clock multiplier table for the 11700. I suppose it's important to note that the default clock multipliers are something that Intel no longer publishes. So it makes it quite difficult to work out at what frequency without power limits the CPUs should be targeting. Uh, and stuff like all core is kind of important information to know because with TDP limits in force, that can move around and it can be different from board to board depending on how uh, efficient the VRM is, how well they've done with their voltage tuning to get within that 65 watt limit, all that sort of stuff. So anyway, in the case of the Core i7-11700, when you're using one core, it'll run at a 49 times multiplier. So with the base clock, that gets you 4.9 gigahertz. Two cores, same frequency. So one and one or two cores heavily utilized, the CPU will sustain 4.9 gigahertz. And that is the published max boost frequency. So whatever you see, like you know, 4.9 or 5 gigahertz or 5.3, that's usually one or two cores. So if your workload requires three or four cores, you're at 4.7 gigahertz. So it drops down 200 megahertz there. Uh, then we've got five cores and six cores. So using five or six cores, that'll drop to 4.6. So another 100 megahertz gets shaved off. Seven cores, 5.4 gigahertz. And then the all core with all eight cores active, which is what I saw in my blender workload with the boards without power limits, 4.4 gigahertz. So if there's no power limits in place, those are the frequencies the CPU will run at depending on the workload. And that's really how they used to work when we had up to four cores. So you've got the max boost of 4.9 and then the all core there of 4.4. However, with 65 watt parts, the base frequency in the case of the 11700 is 2.5 gigahertz. And I think, well, why does it have a base of 2.5 if the all core, so when all eight cores are active, it's 4.4 gigahertz. That's, that's a long way away from 2.5. And that comes back to the TDP. So, and this is where it gets all very messy. So when you've got this, this power limited spec, which as Tim said, isn't the only spec, the all core frequency will be brought down to fit within that 65 watt power limit. So it's a sort of a, a package power if you use something like hardware info. And we saw some boards, to, if when they were, the voltage was tuned very well, they would run at a 3.2 gigahertz all core. So that's well down from the 4.4, but somewhere as low as 2.9. So the voltage tuning wasn't very good there or the VRM wasn't very efficient, a lot of wasted power. It's probably more voltage than anything really because of the way it works. Uh, but yeah, you're still looking at like a 10% variance for TDP limited motherboards. And of course, as I said, even 3.2 gigahertz is well below, or it's a big jump up to 4.4. So we're seeing up to 50% performance boosts in some instances. So that's an explanation of the difference between the TDP and then the clock multiplier table. And where people get confused is they think that the TDP, TDP specification is the specification, but it's not. Intel have a loosely defined specification. So as long as you're running at either those TDP power limits or up to the clock multiplier table, anything at either extreme or anywhere in between is all within the Intel specifications. So very confusing <laughs> it leaves it leaves a lot of room to move in terms of performance because as i gave the example which i feel like a lot of people didn't watch that video right through to the end where i showed from i think it was the seventh generation the eighth generation the ninth yep. generation then we skipped to the 11th where because intel's been stuck on this 14 nanometer plus 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 process for so long normally you would move to a new node that's more efficient increases density and you get your performance and efficiency improvements that way. But because they've been stuck in the one spot trying to add more cores and make them a bit faster, increase the, the max turbo, having to drop that base right down. And it's creating this huge discrepancy between the base clock and the boost clock, especially for parts that, that they're lower uh, tier parts like the 65 watt ones. So I think the example was something like it was around 16, 15, 16% between the base and boost with seventh gen. And it's crept up ever since then. I think it's like almost 100% now with 11th gen with, with parts like the 11700. So as I said, there's just a huge room to move there in terms of performance. So you can be within the spec anywhere and get radically different performance. And that just makes yeah. for a, so I, a, a pretty awful user experience, really. I think a lot of the confusion comes, as you say, down to people believing that the spec is 
one thing as opposed to mm-hmm. a range of things. So mm-hmm. if you think about Intel specification as a range, then it becomes much easier, in my opinion, to understand what Intel allows the processor to do. So as you were talking mm-hmm. about, the minimum specification that Intel allows is basically like a guarantee of performance. They say you're going to get at least the base clock and you're going to be using, it's provided that you have enough power to run at the TDP, which for the 11700 mm-hmm. that we've been using as an example is going to be 65 watts. So that defines sort of the minimum guarantee. So when, uh, let's say you're a big business customer, you want to make sure you're getting a certain level of performance, you want to do a lot of validation based on a certain level of performance, then you need to know what is the minimum that you could possibly get. So that's where that specification comes into play. And then for more enthusiasts like us, like people who would buy Z590 motherboards and run big coolers, Intel has a range that you can run all the way up to. And that's where we start to see the clock multiplier table. And anything Mm -hmm. in between there, like for example, you might have a, let's say you have a motherboard that is running power unlimited, but your cooler isn't very good. So it's going to run at, you know, it could be running at the temperature limit, for example, which would then cause power limits to come into play. It might run in the middle of that range. Or you might get a board where, you know, it, it can't sustain 250 watts, but it can maybe do 150 watts. Well, then it's going to run again somewhere in the middle of that range. And all of these things are allowed by Intel. And as you say, they've kind of trying to have the best of both worlds here by advertising a really low minimum that allows people to Mm -hmm. get away with using low end VRMs, using really crappy entry level coolers and say that that's allowed while also giving enthusiasts the ability to run them at ridiculously high frequencies while using tons of power. And by not advertising either of these things particularly well and just allowing people to go, oh, well, this is a 65 watt processor that can run at 4.4 gigahertz, which is not necessarily true with both of those things enabled at the same time, then yeah, they're kind of getting, it makes it look like their processor is much more efficient or alternatively much faster than it really is under one of those conditions being limited to. Yeah, exactly. And as reviewers, it's been confusing for us so over the years as as this has evolved so it's no no uh surprise i suppose that the audience is confused as well and perhaps we haven't done the best job of explaining it over the years and a lot of people are focused on it's easy to focus on what the tdp uh, tdp spec is because intel tells us what that is and then it's been assumed that it's the motherboard Uh, manufacturers that are just making up their own spec or running without power limits and they're doing that at their own free will which certainly isn't the case but then if you go and ask intel you know is this board running at an all-core of 4.4 gigahertz you know following the clock multiplier table is that it within spec they will tell you yeah that's within spec but (laughs) they don't it's not clear to the viewers to people buying it that that is within spec So it creates all of this confusion. So, yeah, we're trying to address that as best we can, but it's also difficult to explain all the different operating parameters that you'll run into Mm. with these boards. And it makes it more confusing when you have AMD in the market as well, who uses totally different TDP calculations. So their TDP is not comparable to Intel's TDP, and they don't have the same sort of boost behavior with Precision Boost as Intel does on their platform. So whatever you see on an AMD CPU and you go, oh, okay, well, I'm running my CPU. It's running, you know, 105 watts. It's boosting up to the precision boost limits. And then you go over to an Intel platform. It's like, oh, well, now I have to figure out whether I'm going to be running it at 65 watts and getting a certain clock speed or running at 200 watts and getting a different clock speed. The confusion there is definitely real, especially if you're transitioning from one platform to the other. And we've seen similar things in the past, almost in the opposite way, with things like AMD's maximum turbo frequencies when they talk about, you know, oh, this CPU can do 4.9 gigahertz, but they don't necessarily mean sustained 4.9 gigahertz like Mm. Intel might mean. So Mm -hmm. the fact that these two companies are sort of advertising the same sort of things, both of them have a TDP, both of them have maximum clock frequencies, but then that can mean totally different behavior for the user, ends up being quite confusing. Yes, exactly. At least... In the case of AMD, while we have made videos that look at their boost behavior and and help correct some of the issues there with the the variants we saw across a wide range of motherboards, they were able to fix that with updated AGISA code. But at least you were getting 
pretty much the same level yeah. of performance. Clo- very, very fine margins there. It wasn't even 10%, I don't think. There might have been some bad example boards, but generally it was it was very low uh, percentage differences. Whereas here, you can buy one motherboard for $150 US and then a different motherboard for $150 US. And then one board, if you slot an 11700 on it, you load XMP, which most, you know, tech savvy users will know how to do most of them will do that you would hope you load xmp on both boards one for sustained workloads can be up to 50 percent faster which is well we we called it a mess because i think it is and while if you you know are a bit more tech savvy you can use intel's official software like xtu or you can go into the bios and you can manually remove those power limits and in many instances that will restore full performance but again, it depends on the quality of the board. And even some of the boards where it does restore full performance, you can be running at very high VRM temperatures. So a bit of a minefield there is in which boards will actually do it and then which ones are running into VRM thermal problems. So when I've been discussing this with some of the people that have uh, had criticisms of the video or further questions, I've pointed them in the direction of a really good uh, interview done by Ian Cutress over at Nantech, where they interviewed... Uh, I forget the the name of the Intel employee now, but they interviewed him uh, and he basically explained that what is in spec behavior and what is out of spec behavior. And basically it's very simple. Anything that runs above the base clock up to the default clock multiplier table is within spec as we've been saying. So perhaps we can link that interview in the description of this yep. video, just so it's a good interview, people can yeah. go. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff covered in there. And yeah, Intel's officially saying that that stuff is within spec or is in spec, uh, but they're not putting that on the product page or making it clear to to buyers. So that's, I guess, what lands us in this mess. Yeah, and I guess that brings us to what is out of spec behavior. Because if there's something mm-hmm. that's in spec, then there's got to be something that's out of spec. And Intel's been True. pretty clear that overclocking is obviously when it becomes out of spec behavior. So you cannot overclock on a locked processor, whereas of course you can run up to the clock multiplier tables and remove power limits on a locked processor. So as soon as you start overclocking and you've got a K-series chip, then an overclocking flag gets enabled and that means that you're running out of spec. So if you wanna run your you know, your 11900K at five gigahertz all core, then you're overclocking it. And that means mm-hmm. that you're running out of spec. Conversely, you can also have out of spec experiences on the other end, so below the TDP limit. And that's generally because you've either got well insufficient cooling or a motherboard that has insufficient VRM capabilities, and then you get throttling. So throttling also Mm -hmm. can be out of spec behavior. So that means something else has gone wrong. But everything in between Mm -hmm. those two things tends to be the zone of in spec, which as we've talked about is anywhere from, yeah, the base clock at the TDP right up to the clock multiplier table. And yeah, Intel tends to be pretty clear with this in terms of that particular interview and also, you know, obviously the fact that you cannot overclock on the locked processes. Yeah, it's exactly right. So stuff that I imagine a lot of people will be familiar with, stuff like the ASUS MC, so multi-core enhancement feature, that runs all cores at the maximum single turbo frequency. So in the case of this processor, it would go from 4.4 gigahertz to 4.9 if you know, this CPU supported overclocking, which it doesn't. So, And that would be yeah, overclocking, anything like to that, clarify. And that, that, that would be, be out of That spec. would be overclocking, yep. yes, because when you have eight cores active, it's meant to be, you know, 4.4 gigahertz, and then you're raising it to 4.9. So you're adjusting, you're increasing the clock multiplier table uh, to, the, to the highest value that is there. And then, of course, if you go above that, which with a K uh, skew part to, you know, five point whatever, then yeah, it, it's out of spec. So that that's basically it. So there really isn't, in the case of the 11th gen, there isn't too much room to move out of spec. The, the CPUs yeah. are pretty close to what they can really do. Uh, and again, so. that brings us back to the same thing of Intel trying to have the best of both worlds. As we've seen mm-hmm. AMD with Precision Boost getting very, very close to the limits of their processor with you know, trying to run it basically as fast as it can go all of the time, Intel has been doing very similar things. We used to have more overclocking headroom with K-series processors, but over time, as they try and close the gap with AMD, they want to increase the clock multiplier table, which in turn, because they've been stuck on 14 nanometer, increases the power consumption. But then they don't want to advertise a processor that is a 200-watt processor. 
because That's right. how does a 200 watt processor look up against a 105 watt or 95 watt processor from AMD? It looks like they're using a lot more power, which they is true, but they don't want to advertise that. So we're currently in this situation, as we've been talking about, where yes, they don't really want to admit the truth about their processes in some way by making this these parts 65 watts. I mean, you'd say, for example, 65 watts is a little bit ridiculous for a part like a 11700. It just is not really a 65 watt part. Well, I agree. It's also a little bit clever. Uh, they've The situation they've found themselves in, this is kind of a really good solution for them. Because if you look at a lot of benchmarks, a lot of the applications that reviewers and even people benchmarking their own system tend to run, like Cinebench, for example, I'm talking about you know, CPU uh, benchmarks that look specifically at CPU performance, they don't run for you know five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, unless you put them on a loop. So if you want a Cinebench score, especially these higher end parts, they finish it pretty quickly. So they spend a lot of time in the maximum power state there. And it really helps with their score. But then if you're looking at thermals or power consumption, generally people will loop those tests or, or run a test that's longer. So it does, in a sense, help them get best of both worlds. And take gaming, for example, which you know, a lot of reviewers and a lot of people watching reviews are really heavily interested and focused on the gaming performance. And games won't, like in the case of something like the 11700, it won't peg all cores at 100% load. For the, for the duration of the test. Yeah. The CPU might only be at 20, 30%, which is off, that's really often the case in a whole lot of games when you've got an eight core CPU. So this CPU is just putting those cores up to the absolute maximum frequency. And if you remove the power limits, there's very little to be gained there in extra performance. So some people argue, does it even matter? But when you get down the track and the games start using more and more of the CPU, the gap between whatever the competing part is that doesn't have the same problem will widen. And, and you can take an older CPU as an example, like if you bought something like a Core i5-8400, that, that performed really well when it first you know, hit the market. But if you run at 65 watt limit now, I imagine that gap has widened to something like a Ryzen 7 3700X or whatever you may be comparing it to. Yeah, and there is some justification for doing it the way that Intel is doing it, apart from it obviously being a clever marketing tactic in that they do understand that a lot of the general apps that someone uses are going to be your sort of short burst apps. Like if you're just web browsing, mm -hmm. you know, at times you're just going to load something up, it's going to need to do a little bit of a burst, which will run at that maximum PL2 state will consume 200 watts for like a second. It will run at the maximum turbo frequencies. Then it will drop down and you won't need to be using the processor anymore. So it makes sense that mm -hmm. if they're going to say a processor is 65 watts, that for burst applications, you want to average the power out over a long period of time so that on average you're using 65 watts, but that might be using 200 watts briefly and then zero watts or idle state like 30 watts or whatever it is for a longer period of time you get the average under 65 watts so that's generally how intel has i guess justified these sorts of power limits and it makes a, a lot more sense in mobile platforms where yeah you know you're you're running a laptop with a 45 watt processor over time it's going to heat up it's going to run very close to its thermal limits you can't just run it at 100 watts indefinitely but you might be able to run it for 100 watts for a little bit before dropping down and that's where we see these limits really come into where it makes sense but on a desktop platform they've kind of I guess trying to make their CPUs more efficient for users while still giving them the performance they need in boost states. And I just don't necessarily think that it applies as well to a desktop platform. And it creates issues in the future as well, because for example, there's nothing stopping Intel from making like a 25 watt desktop processor and calling this 25 mm -hmm. watts, but it runs at 200 watts some of the time. So there's well, really no, there's no lower limit that they could keep going down and down and down in terms of TDP rating and keep making their clock sure. speeds lower and lower and lower. I mean, we've already seen that, you know, comparing 7th gen to now. There's nothing stopping them from making a 1 gigahertz processor if they really wanted to. All, all of that said, if the TDP spec was the spec, so, and again, if, if it was the spec, motherboard manufacturers would have to adhere to that specification. It's not the Wild West where ASUS can get, just overclock Intel's processors. Intel you know, would cut their allocation. They have to follow, because Intel doesn't want 
their partners coming up with their own poorly validated specifications that create stability issues and God knows what for their customers. They want it to just work and they want it to be stable and they want the customers to have a good experience. So next time they buy a CPU, they're more inclined to buy with the company that gave them the good experience previously. So th there's just, I, I, I know for a fact, like they're not making up their own specifications. So they might add features like MCE. There may have been brief periods of time where that sort of stuff was, you know, they got a bit cheeky and enabled it by default, but that was always corrected. You know, Intel won't let them do that because if you let motherboard manufacturers do whatever they want, they're going to try and deliver the most performance they can out of the box to make their boards look the absolute best. And they'll do it at the cost of stability. They just yeah. will. And we've seen that so, not just with MCE. We've seen that before with things like motherboard manufacturers enabling, enabling BCLK overclocking on like locked yes. parts yeah. or enabling yeah. memory overclocking on B-series um, motherboards before that was an allowed feature, which of course a motherboard yep. manufacturer can just let that happen. But usually you'll see that BIOS update come out and then very quickly be, be retracted to remove that functionality because Intel does not want out of spec behavior. And those two things are out of spec behavior on locked processes. They don't want that happening. Yep. So they make the corrections. So they're not so, just allowed to do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, now that we're clear on that, if the TDP spec was the spec, it would mean that the Intel CPUs perform, as you see in the reviews, and they have quite a substantial amount of overclocking headroom. So that would be something you'd really have to explore because it's something they offer that their competition does. And yeah, that comes at the cost of you know, huge increases in power consumption and difficult to cool processes. But it is a thing you, you you can get as good or better performance than their competition, perhaps through overclocking. So it changes the story there. Whereas at the moment, as, as Tim said a few times, they're trying to have the best of both worlds. So is it a fi an efficient process that's quite clever with its power management? Or is it brute forced and just runs to a clock multiplier table and uses as much power as it needs to do that? And the answer is, it's both. Pick one. Uh, some boards adhere to the TDP, some follow the clock multiplier table, both are within spec. That is the point. That is the problem. We blame, we, we, we put the blame squarely on Intel. Yes, 100%. And I think, if anything, Intel is giving OEMs something that they can get a benefit from by having this very wide range of official in-spec behavior because it allows a motherboard manufacturer to make an extremely cheap and crappy B560 motherboard because they don't have to design a board that supports 200 watts of processing. <laughs> they can support mm -hmm. a board that does 65 watts or 125 watts, 125 watts being the maximum that you can get on these sorts of platforms. So all they have to do is meet that bare minimum, run at 125 mm -hmm. watts, we will support the 11900K, that's it. Whereas if the spec was say higher and they were running their processes at 200 watts at the clock multiplier table, suddenly OEMs need to spend a lot more money on their motherboards. And a B560 mm. motherboard that costs you know, $110 right now is just not feasible because the VRM has to be so much better. You, know, you can't have motherboards with no heat sinks anymore. You're gonna to have to put mm. heat sinks on it. That adds cost. You have to add more phases. You have to add better components. And that allows, current, the current system allows those OEMs to sell boards in that very low power range, which is fine if the customer that buys that board is also buying a locked processor, running it at the power limits. It's a lower end part, so they're not expecting high performance, but it's not great if that customer then wants to upgrade down the line to an 11900K and are expecting the performance seen in the reviews. So by doing mm -hmm. this, again, one of the main factors that has been a competition between Intel and AMD is motherboard pricing, where generally speaking, you know, a B550 motherboard may be a bit cheaper than a B560 motherboard. It would have been an even larger gap in terms of motherboard pricing if the Intel spec was more defined towards the top of the range that they currently allow, which would make Intel, again, less competitive. And this is where the 14 nanometer issues, the power consumption issues, start to affect them in more ways than just oh, look, it uses a lot of power. It's things like motherboard cost and cooling cost and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And sort of circling back to my original video, it also creates this weird situation where with an entry-level motherboard running the 11700, in a lot of workloads, it's slower than a better B560 board running the 11400. 
So it's this weird crossover where you can upgrade your CPU and not really get any extra performance. Yep. So uh, b- depending on power limits and that sort of stuff, because obviously a 50% performance uplift is well over the additional cores you get there. So it just creates this huge mess for motherboard buyers. Mm. Well, in- Intel buyers in general, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And reviewers as well, because it's a very difficult situation for us to make a review that says this is how this processor performs, but then you could go and buy a motherboard that we didn't use for testing, particularly if we're testing Z590 with these CPUs, and then you're going and buying a B560 motherboard, and then you're not getting the same performance, which completely changes everything we've said in the review. It changes how competitive a processor is versus its competition. It changes things like power consumption data. That does favor Intel in that situation, but that's important as well. It changes our recommendations for potentially things like coolers and that's not a good situation to be in where in this enthusiast market where a lot of people building their own PC do research and watch reviews to know the parts they want to buy are potentially getting screwed basically in terms of the performance that they may ultimately getting when they're buying their system. And again, Intel is effectively allowing this to happen. And really, it would be great if they didn't do that. So then mm-hmm. everyone's on a level playing field when it comes to performance. And then you don't need to go and make a giant video where you buy like 30 B560 motherboards and test them all because you'd have no idea which one is going to run at the power limits and which one's going to run at the clock multiply table. Like that's just yeah, ridiculous. That's right. Yeah, well, it, it creates the layers of problems that we've got because as you say, there's there's boards that run at the clock multiplier table, there's boards that run at the power limits and it's not really price dependent. There can be really expensive B560 boards that adhere to the power limits, but they are capable of running without the power limits. So there's that, but then there's also some boards really aren't capable of running with the power limits removed. They'll either uh, VRM throttle, thermal throttle, or they will do it, but the VRM will be running well over 100 degrees. So if you're trying to build a cheap editing rig or something that wants to heavily utilize your CPU, some sort of productivity task, not great if you're running your motherboard for long periods of time at those very high temperatures. Uh, you know, you might've been able to get another board for the same price that wouldn't have had that problem. Or maybe if you were aware of that upfront, you would have spent 10 or $20 more to get a board that can can sustain that performance without you know, risking very high thermals on the, the VRM. Mm. And you get, you get a very different experience with AMD, for example, because, because their processes are so much more efficient. You start to have these things where, as you've talked about, you can basically buy any B550 motherboard. Obviously, there are mm-hmm. some crappier examples and some better examples. But generally speaking, the performance range that you see there is they're all about the same because there's no need for one part to run it at a low t- low power limits and another part to run it really high because the power consumption is manageable with an AMD processor. Mm-hmm. Even something like a 5950X is consuming, you know, not 200 watts, well below that when we're looking at peak power consumption. So yeah. the efficiency differences, of, at least over time, I think we've come to understand more and more the implications of the difference in power consumption and the difference in efficiency on a desktop platform. Previously, people have just, I guess, dismissed it a little bit in terms of, mm-hmm. oh, this doesn't really matter because ultimately you can just use a bigger cooler and you know it's a desktop. Desktops don't need to be power limited. It's all fine. But then what we're seeing with this generation is really the head of it where actually it's not super fine and there's a lot of complications that it comes into and AMD being the more efficient platform has allowed them all sorts of advantages that maybe we didn't really expect to play out in this way. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I don't want to make this too much of an AMD versus Intel thing because I know where that leads us, but I know what you're saying. Uh, this does lead me to, to a, a comment that I saw quite often, whereas people were saying, you know, we're making a mountain out of a molehill because you can just remove the power limits and most of those boards will run at the full performance, which I've mentioned a few times now. And it's like, okay, that is true. For a lot of boards, that will be the case. But that doesn't make it any less of a disaster, in my opinion. It doesn't make it, you know, it's not clear which boards will do it. And it's not clear that you have to do that. Like a lot of people were shocked. There were plenty of people that watched that video that watch a lot of our content and they were shocked that removing the power limits could result in such a massive performance uplift for core heavy workloads. And you, you know, saying that that should be common knowledge or you're stupid for not knowing that, well, I don't really like that attitude towards it because I'm sure there's a lot of things that you may not know about in life that 
you'd, you'd rather made it uh, you'd rather that it was made clear than hidden from you and you, you found out the hard way mm. so and like when you go into it's, a, it's not a, when you go into a motherboard sorry, bias i'm just interested how difficult yeah. is it to find the right setting to enable you know full power limits or removing the power limits like not yep. you're not only needing to know that you need to do that, but then you actually need to go right. and execute it. In other words, where is the setting in the BIOS? What there's a lot of confusing stuff in there. So you need to be you need to go beyond just the knowledge. You need to then know, you know, for this motherboard, what's the setting called? Do I need to use XTU in Windows as opposed to a BIOS feature? Is that difficult mm-hmm. to find? Uh, it depends on the board. I mean, as the saying goes, you know, knowing is half the battle. So if you do know, at least you can go and research or work that out. Uh, whether it's wise to do that will depend on your board. So you, if you were worried about blowing up your board, which you know, can take your CPU with it, then maybe that's something you don't want to do. But if you think that your motherboard's VRM can handle those 150, 200 watt loads, then yeah, you have to work out how you do that. Some boards are certainly easier than others, and it's not even the same for a brand. So ASRock, for example, with their better quality boards, they'll have an option in the BIOS, something like remove power limits or something like that. So you just enable that, and it removes all the power limits with one option selected. Uh, MSI give you, I'm, I can't remember exactly what it's labeled, but they basically give you the option of choosing, there's one of three options. So one's like the box cooler, which is the TDP limited specification. And then all of the boards have a tower cooler or a liquid cooler. And generally they're both just completely uncapped performance. So if you find that menu, you can select that and it will remove all the power limits that way. That's not super um, obvious, if I'm honest, to label it under like a cooler not, designation as opposed to power limit. So yeah, yeah. and as ASUS, you know, they usually word, th- I mean, enabling XMP on ASUS boards in the past has been quite difficult because they like to use their own jargon and different menu systems. But, you know, their boards overall are pretty good in that regard. A lot of people like their biases. So, but yeah, it varies from board to board. You can you know, download the XTU software and you can remove the power limits that way. Uh, but again, you, it's not super tricky, but there are more things. You, know, you want to max out the, the timer. You want to max out a few, di- you know, a few different options there. I think there's about three or four in total that you need to max out. And it requires you to load into yeah. Windows and do it. Which isn't yeah, download the persistent. software and install yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just extra steps, basically, that you don't have to do on competing platforms. And again, it's the fact that you need to know that you need to do that if you want the full performance of the processor. Mm. Yeah, it's just not a great situation to be in. It, it, it's, it, it's a whole lot of sort of complex overclocking steps that, as it turns out, aren't overclocking. Yeah, and you sort of... Like a lot of people when they watch our videos are going to be more technically inclined than your sort of average buyer that's going out and oh. has heard, hey, you know, Intel is good value right now. You know, if you're building a mm-hmm. new system, Intel is the way to go. So you go to a store, you just pick a B560 board off the shelf, you grab your CPU and your memory, off you go. You'll have no idea about this. No idea. You, if you've never watched well, Hardware Unbox, you've never, you, you don't do a lot of research apart from what you know, what CPU fits in the motherboard and what RAM fits in the motherboard, then this is just an added headache that is very difficult to understand and would just, yeah, comp- you, you're just not going to know. You're just not going to know if you're that sort of more casual end user type person. And it's not even just about the performance that you're receiving right now. As I said, as games become, say you bought like an 11400F and in a year or two, gaming became much more demanding and the six core processor was starting to see 80, 90% utilization. Maybe stuttering was getting introduced or, you know, the FPS just wasn't as good as it was and you're running at the TDP limits. So you could then spend a lot more money and buy something like an eight core model because you don't want to upgrade your system or whatever it may be. So you slot in an 11700. You could have just removed the power limits on the 11400F and you would have got almost the same upgrade in performance by buying a different CPU. So that's not great. They, yeah, that's it's not just not a great situation. So for all of those reasons, that's why we call the whole B560 platform a disaster. And we're not saying the chipset is a disaster. It's more the Intel specification and what it does to 65 watt parts is the disaster. But it becomes a disaster on B560 opposed to Z590 because half of the boards run at the power limits and half of them don't. At least that's what I've found so far with all of my testing. Whereas not so much of an issue with Z590 because every single brand except for ASRock 
ignores the power limits and just follows the clock multiplier table. So you will not see this issue on any MSI, Gigabyte or ASUS Z590 motherboards, which makes it a bit easier. You can just buy one of those boards, slot in any of the CPUs and they will just run at the clock multiplier table. ASRock follows the TDP limits on the Z590 motherboards, I suspect because of a lot of the issues they have with Z490. Uh, and But they have made the option to remove power limits in the bar, so one and click thing. So there is that. So I guess there's a couple of topics to round out this video. And the one thing I'm interested in, in your thoughts in is, should reviewers be testing these CPUs on the power limited platforms or should they be testing them at the clock multiplier table power unlimited configuration because there's always a lot of discussion around this as to which way is sort of the correct way to be testing and obviously mm -hmm. if you test one you're going to not be showing the performance you may be getting in the other configuration so what's your opinion on i, I know you already test without the power limits enabled most of the mm -hmm. time um mm -hmm. but where do you see all that stand i i think i'd start by saying there is no right or wrong answer because they are both in spec. So there's that to begin with. The reasons why we choose to run at the clock multiplier table without any enforced power limits is because we, especially in the past, have mostly tested on the Z series motherboards because traditionally B series boards we've sort of recommended avoiding because you get stuck at lower memory speeds and yep. you know it just hasn't been as good value basically. Whereas that's all changed now, which has made this more complicated, which I suppose is why we're having this conversation. But with Z590 motherboards, take Z490 for example, almost all of the boards ran without the power limits. So we thought in almost all instances when we're testing these boards, we will be going and manually changing all the power limits. And that's actually a more complicated process than going the other way. So you have to make sure that everything is set correctly to run at that Intel base specification or, or, or their, their guidance or whatever you want to call it. So we've avoided that. And I also, again, don't like it for reasons I mentioned earlier, whereas it can be misleading, especially for productivity benchmarks. You're showing a Cinebench score from maybe an average of three runs or maybe the best of three runs, but that's not how that application works. If you took the score, which you can do now in Cinebench 23, if you took the score after a 30 minute loop, it can be quite different to the, the the best run or an average of three because then you're well and truly running at the power limits for that last run or probably the last 20 runs or whatever. So we don't like it in that sense as well because it can be a bit misleading on what you would get or it'd be less than what you would get on a Z590 or Z490 motherboard not running the power limits and then, you know, it may it, you, you're sort of handicapping it against the competing parts if like the Ryzen processors yeah. So we just don't do it for that reason. And also, I suppose it could be a little bit misleading if the base or the all or the all core is, say, 4.8 gigahertz without power limits, but then you enable power limits and it drops down to 4.3. And then you enable something like MCE or a basic overclocking feature that runs at the max single, and you get quite a big performance uplift there. So it leads you to believe that there's quite a lot of overclocking headroom with that part when you take it out of the box, put it on the motherboard, it turns out there's only a very small amount of overclocking headroom. So that can change what you think you need to build, you know, uh, build into the equation in terms of cooling overhead and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, it's basically, we just thought this is how they perform out of the box on most boards. So that's what we want to show our audience. And we're not yep. really interested in doing an OEM spec review because we're not reviewing Dell and HP systems. We're reviewing yeah. parts because you guys are going to buy those parts and build your own computer. I, so I think with all these discussions, it's like, so long as the reviewer that you're looking at is testing everything in the same way, then it's not yeah. that big of a deal. Like yeah. you, the testing is still valid because it is part of the Intel specification, but obviously it would be bad if, for example, you were testing an 11th gen part without power limits, but you tested the 10th gen part with power limits because that would yeah. exaggerate the performance difference between those two generations and mm -hmm. lead people to believe that you were getting a much more substantial upgrade than you were getting. Mm -hmm. I think there has been some instances potentially with Intel's own... Um, internal benchmarks that they kind of show in our press events where they I believe someone discovered one instance where they had done that exact thing mm -hmm. which obviously That's makes nice. their platform look a lot better um, but yeah mm -hmm. so long as you're testing yeah the sort of everything in a consistent manner it tends to be fine but I guess it does bring up you know 
now that we know the B560 motherboards do run with power limits in a lot of instances, it does open the opportunity for, say, follow-up content. Sort of like we were talking about with the NVIDIA driver overhead issue where people were saying, oh, well, you need to test in this way in your day one reviews. This does make for good follow-up content. You test with the high-end Z590, everything, you know, not limited configuration, and then you can follow up with that B560 testing mm -hmm. for people that will end up with those motherboards so then you can sort of see where the performance lies for those people. Yeah, I think for this, the the K skew parts, the 125 watt parts, not too much of a big deal there, but certainly for the 65 watt parts, you really ideally want to test with both yep. the TDP and the clock multiplier performance because yeah, it does vary so much that the, 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 there's no right or wrong, but the ideal answer would be to test both ways. You yeah. know, I think it's as simple as that. So, so I guess the final thing I that I wanted to get into was this is obviously a problem. It's a big problem. It would be mm -hmm. great for this not to exist, for there not to be confusion. So how does Intel fix this? What is something that they could do with, say, a future generation processor that would solve this so that you're not having these large discrepancies between which motherboards you buy so that the TDP becomes maybe potentially more accurate. What are sort of your thoughts on what Intel should be doing? Should they be advertising a higher TDP? Well, I think Intel's hoping that the problem will solve itself and they'll be in a situation that AMD's in. They move to a more efficient process node and the problem kind of takes care of itself because, well, that would be probably the easiest way out for them. Uh, and short of that, like, say, say we're talking about the 11th gen, what would be a better way of handling this? Having at least two different power states. So you can choose, to, and boards could be certified to be like, you know, 65 watt or TDP. TDP probably isn't the right word anymore, but they could be, uh, and we've seen this in the past, like where I think it was first or second gen Ryzen motherboards, there was... A320 board, I want to say, that was only rated for 65 watt. So the higher parts, like the Ryzen 7 parts, weren't officially supported by those boards and uh, perhaps didn't work at all. But where I'm going with this is you could have the entry-level, dirt-cheap motherboards, you know, skimpy VRM with no heat sinks, and that could be the 65 watt model. But if you spend, you know, $30, $40 more, you can get the 125 watt model or the 200 watt model or whatever it needs to be. So... Yeah, I mean, probably not an ideal situation for Intel, I guess, uh, with how they compete with AMD, but it would make things a lot clearer for people that, you know, if you want uncapped the full performance of these parts, you know, you need a certain board. Yeah, I think that would make a lot of sense. Something along the lines of potentially, I mean, a lot of people use Arc, for example, Intel's database of the CPUs, which gives you all this information on the mm -hmm. clock speeds and TDP and all that sort of thing. I think it would just be good to potentially just have two different sections, have a section up the top that says this is the like the minimum performance and then it gives you the base clock and it gives you the TDP. And then you could have like a, a maximum performance level section or whatever and that would give you your boost clocks and then a power level that you like a typical power level for an all-core workload at the maximum frequency. So at least mm -hmm. then buyers are getting... I mean, obviously, this, as you say, it's not advantageous for Intel to do this because they don't want to advertise high power consumption levels. But this would be a lot clearer for buyers to know that you could either be running at that lower specification or running at the higher specification. And as you say, potentially a certification process could, could help a lot there for motherboard buying or just knowing the performance in general. So, yeah, I guess it's just really... It really comes down to, at the end, a big lack of clarity around these things, like mm. needing to get a person from Intel into an interview with a Nantech to explain the Intel specification is not really an ideal way to be explaining all of this to enthusiasts. Like People who are watching our videos tend to be educated and are able to understand these things, so by trying to hide it away, it's not... It just leads to these yeah, confusing yeah. situations where people have no idea what's going on. That's right. That's why it makes no sense to defend Intel on this one, say this isn't Intel's fault or, you know, however you want to defend this, it's bad for you. It's bad for people buying into these platforms. It, you want them to be more transparent. You want them to be more open and honest. And they're deliberately not doing that right now. Like this hasn't happened by accident. They used to publish the clock multiplier tables. This used to be things that all reviewers knew. If you Google 
11 900k clock multiplier table or all core frequency you, you've got to rely on reviewers giving you that information and I, I tried to find the 11 700 clock multiplier table i couldn't find it online that, that information just isn't there anymore you can if you buy the cpu install it in your system and load up the xtu software you can you can read that information from the cpu straight away but Short of that, unless someone else is providing that information for you, it's just difficult to find. And the reason is, again, it's not by accident. They used to tell you what the CPU's expected all-core frequency was. And in the case of the 11700, it is 4.4 gigahertz. That is the official all-core, eight-core load frequency, 4.4 gigahertz. Except some boards, it'll be 3.2. Some it'll be 4.4. Some it'll be as low as 2.9. And again, this isn't by accident. Intel is doing this deliberately and it is bad for consumers. So as far as I'm concerned, you should not be defending Intel for this at all. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's definitely a mess that is not, it's not a necessary mess. It's, I mean, I guess from a marketing perspective, they're kind of trying to do everything they possibly can to compete. But in terms of, you know, what makes sense for consumers, it is totally unnecessary and, and it's just one of those things where it's so frustrating that we have to come and make a video which i'm now just looking at how long we've been recording for we've been going for an <laughs> hour talking we've been talking about this for an hour and people are probably still going to come out of this video being like what's going on yeah i mean there's not really too much more to say on this one i wouldn't have thought we've kind mm -hmm. of gone through about how this is a big big mess it's not a great situation for b560 buyers it's not great for reviewers it's not great for intel they're probably loving life because they can just do whatever and apparently that's all okay but yeah it would... well yeah I, I hope for those who were genuinely confused this video has been helpful i hope some of our explanations again not scripted it's sort of at the top of my head i've got a couple of notes here but hopefully it was easy to understand and it, it did help clear it up for some of you um that'd be nice yep well, I think we'll wrap it up there, Tim. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, I like doing these discussion videos. I always enjoy bringing out Monitor Steve for a bit of fun <laughs> to talk about the latest stuff. And yeah, I found your testing in the original B560 disaster video, which you ha if you haven't watched, please go back and watch that. I found that a really interesting video and certainly the results are, are not what I was expecting. I guess I was, to be fair, I was expecting at some point boards to be TDP, have mm -hmm. to follow the TDP specification. But... Sure. I guess I wasn't expecting the performance difference to be as large as you were showing in some applications and, and certainly the mm. the low clock speed that some of those boards were running was was very surprising. So yeah, it's been a bit of a bit of a learning experience for me as someone that doesn't necessarily test CPUs all that often. Yeah, well, I can tell it was very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that note, the B560 VR, VRM temperature testing is coming. It's that kind of testing in general, like doesn't matter what chipset it is or motherboard, that stuff takes a long time. It generally takes me, especially when I'm doing, I think I'm doing four or five processes per board, I think four. And you're looking at like a day's work for one board there. Uh, but in the case of B560 and a lot of the boards, or at least half of them, as I said, I've got to test the board twice. So I've got to test the out of the box specification with 265 watt, and then I think it's two 125 watt processors then remove the power limits and repeat all over again. So yeah, it's, it, there's a minimum of eight hours of stress testing just there. So you can see how it takes one day to test one B560 board if I start in the morning and, and go till uh, quite late at night. So anyway, that's the situation there, but I've done about seven boards now. I've got about seven that I'd like to still cover. Once that's done, you'll see that content and you'll know which boards to avoid and which ones are pretty good value yep. for those of you that want to buy what I think are good value parts like the 11400, the F variant, 11700, and the F variant there. And this will also apply to 10th gen parts that you want to put on those boards as well. Yeah, so look out for that content when it comes on the channel in the next couple of weeks. Um, of course, you can support us if you're in the 20% club and you've watched all the way to the end of this long video, then maybe consider supporting us on Patreon or Floatplan if you're not already a member there. I imagine lots of people who get to this point probably already are, so thank you for your support. Uh, but if you do sign up and become a new member, you'll be able to chat to us in Discord. You'll be able to join our monthly live streams, which honestly are pretty similar to this sort of thing. Usually you're here in person because we're doing Q&As yep. at the same time. But um, yeah, very similar sort of discussions we have on those. And yeah, anything else to say? Anything else to add? 
Now all that stuff, the live stream will be coming up in, I'd say, about less than a week from when this video goes live or about that. So, yep. yeah. If you're interested, you know, <laughs> now's the time to jump in and get, get access to that. Baz Sims has a lot of cool, a lot of other cool things there. But nothing else to add. I think we're going to wrap this one up. My, my throat's getting a bit dry, Tim. <laughs> so, yep. uh, yeah, good stuff. Just thank you, everyone, for watching, especially if you made it this far. I mean, that's just awesome. Can't thank you enough. So cool. I'm just going to say that I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. We'll see you. See you next in time. The next one. <laughs>